turn it down if it's really annoying. Hang on, I'll do a talk. Hi everyone, hi Telegraph Outdoor Show people. How's it going? I hope you bought lots of bikes and tents and things. And so now, no doubt, you're a little bit bored of buying bikes and tents. And you're like, you know what? I'd really like to go to the Incredible Ocean Zone and find out what the best animal ever is. And some of you might already have an idea about what the best animal ever already is. You've probably got a favorite animal. Have you got a favorite animal? Quick, what's your favorite animal? A puffin. That's a good, that's a good one. Okay, I like a puffin. My favorite puffin fact is that um, Inuit people, they really, really love eating puffins. And when the babies leave the nest, they stand in front of the nest with a giant net and they catch the baby puffins and then they stuff them inside a seal skin and they do it up and then they leave it to rot for six months and then they can eat the rotten baby puffins. There you go, and apparently it's delicious. So there you go. As they're your favourite animal, that that's, should be on your bucket list to eat fermented puffin chicks, okay? That's okay? So that's on your bucket list now. Right, okay. So going on from that, I have got a favourite animal, and I'm going to tell you all about what my favourite animal is. And before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. So, uh, I am an oceanographer, and I quite enjoy measuring the ocean. I go around the coast of the UK, and I stick these in the water. These are wave buoys, and they bob up and down. We measure how big the waves are, and they send it through to the internet uh, on this aerial every 10 minutes. And it's a really good way for us to build up a long-term idea of whether storms are becoming uh, worse, whether they're becoming more frequent, whether they're becoming more severe. Um, so it gives us an idea. This is what they look like when they first go out. And six months later, they get covered in seaweed. And it was my job to go out there, clean them up, service them, make sure that they were still working. Always sounded a little bit dodgy when I told people, sorry, I can't come out tonight. I'm going out to sea to service boys. Um, but there we go. So occasionally what they look like, they look like this. And when they look like that, it's very easy for boats to hit them. So when a boat does hit them, they break their mooring and they start drifting around and they cost 24 grand each. Luckily, they have a little thing where they send you a text message, you can go and get them back. So they wash up on beaches and this is a picture of me in my underwear dragging one back into the sea so I can refloat it. So there we go, I've talked about puffin chicks and now I've shown you a picture of me in my pants. So moving on from that then, um, what else do I do? I work for this organisation called Whale Fest and we run the largest marine festival on earth. It happened in Brighton last year and next year hopefully it's going to be in Cardiff. Um, we have 15,000 people a day attending. This guy here, Steve Backshaw, Deadly 60, he's giving a couple of talks there about the number 60, I can only presume. Um, for some reason that's deadly. But, and uh, when I'm not doing that, I dress up as a pirate. I say, like, look, it's like the same, look at that. And uh, I go into schools with a life size plate or killer whale and I talk to people about the sea. And I work for Whale Fest, uh, this charity called the World Cetacean Alliance, and um, this uh, education program called Incredible Ocean. So, let's get back to this. The best animal in the world ever. Let's find out what the best animal is. It is Lama. Look at his eyes. Look at his little eyes. They're so cute. Oh, it's not you, African pygmy hedgehog. You can get lost. Right, let's see what else it is. Oh, look at his little eyes. It's so cute. It fits into the palm of your hand. It's not you, dwarf hamster. You can get lost. Oh, seal cub. You're so beautiful. Look at his fluffy in his eyes. It's not you, seal cub. You can get lost as well. This thing is actually quite cute. This is a pygmy marmoset. And they are so cute that they're now endangered because people keep t stealing them from the jungles. Um, because they look, look how cute. They fit on the finger. Oh, look at his eyes. They're so cute. So obviously you're like, okay, this guy's just a pirate. He's in the Incredible Ocean Zone. He's going to like some kind of cute animal that's going to be in the sea. So uh, this, is, this is probably the cutest animal that I think of in the sea. This is the vaquita. And this is a type of porpoise. It's ever so tiny. It's not much bigger than a dog. These hang about in the sea of Cortez near California. We didn't know they existed until 1987. 
and what we have now found out that there's less than 50 of them left because they keep getting tangled up in um, ghost nets. A ghost net is when fishermen lose their nets and they go drifting throughout the sea and they still catch fish and things like Akita, sharks, dolphins go in there to get the fish that have been caught and they end up getting tangled up as well. So some of the charities we're working with are trying to sort this thing out. But the problem is about cute animals is they're cute and they get all the money because it's not fair because we can't all be pandas, okay? This is a book from the Ugly Animal Preservation Society. Simon Walker wrote this and he's like, well, you know what? We have so many adverts on telly that are like, just three pound a month. Three pound a month to save the cute fluffy thing. Whereas if someone was like, look mate, this sea slug's about to go extinct. No one would care. And who are we as humans to come along and say, this animal's cute, we're going to save it, it's worth saving. This animal, animal's well in, let's let it die. So, this is the blobfish. It has been voted the ugliest animal on earth and it is the mascot of the Ugly Animal Preservation Society. I'm quite pleased to say that my favorite animal is an ugly animal and it is this. It is the octopus. This is the common octopus, Octopus vulgaris. And essentially the reason I wrote this talk is I had an octopus tattoo done. And I got really bored telling people why I had an octopus tattoo done. And at the end of this, what I'd like you to do is hopefully, if I've done my job, you're all going to run out and get octopus tattoos as well. There's my octopus tattoo, it's done there. You've got one as well, octopus tattoo crew, yeah. So yeah, talk to one of us, we'll tattoo you up. If you want one on your face, something like that, it's definitely will make you much more employable in the future. So, this is it, the octopus. I'm going to tell you an array of amazing octopus facts. You're going to be like, what? I did not know that. It is now my new favourite animal. It's much better than a puffin. There we go. So, why are they cool? Well, first of all, the most famous octopus ever, this is Paul, and he can predict World Cup results. He hangs about in an aquarium in Germany, and he predicted the winners of the 2010 World Cup. What they did is they would get two cubes, and they'd put different countries' flags on those cubes. They'd put food in the cubes, and whatever cube Paul went to first, that team would win. Incredible. It just turned out he really, really liked the flags of the teams that happened to do really well. So he's not a psychic octopus. Unfortunately, he's just very, very good at gambling. So yes, that's Paul. Why else are they cool? There is this thing. This is the Australian blue ringed octopus. And this holds the world record for being the most venomous animal on earth. It's got essentially the world's worst breath. It has a load of bacteria that live in its mouth, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that give off a neurotoxin. And just one bite from this, this toxin goes into your bloodstream and it stops your brain from communicating with the rest of your body. So your brain no longer sends a signal to your heart to beat or to your lungs to breathe and you end up drowning in your own body. The only way to survive a bite from this is if you happen to get bitten with someone who really, really likes you, who is prepared to do CPR on you for four hours until the neurotoxin wears off. That is the only way to survive it. But luckily, it comes with a little thing, a warning signal that's like, hey guys, really, I'm nasty, I flash, don't come near me. I like to think this is like the disco ray neon octopus. This guy, he's always going out Friday nights. <laughs> disco rave neon octopus there you go he's pretty cool so why else are they cool well there's not this guy who's just the venomous octopus you've also got these guys that are venomous this these are a load of octopus that live in antarctica and they've got antifreeze in their blood to stop them from freezing they've also got hold the world record for the most toxic venom that can work at the lowest possible temperature and so doctors are now looking at this and how the poisons work in them to see whether we can use it to make new medicines and things like that, which is pretty cool. They can also be cute. 
This is a Dumbo octopus. Oh, it's so cute. And it's a really, really ancient form of octopuses. They don't have um, suckers. They've got hooks inside them. And they flap these ears up and down and they float about. And last year, scientists found one that was so cute, just hanging about, looking cute, that they called it a Pistatuthis adorabilis because it's so cute. So they, are, they can be cute as well, which is quite cool. So why else? This thing! This is an incredible animal. This is the blanket octopus. And loads of its tentacles have got a giant flaps of skin between them. And this holds the world record for the most amount of sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is the difference in size between men and ladies. This is the lady, and she is 40,000 times bigger than the male. I like big women, but I have no idea what it would be like to date someone that much bigger than me. Similarly, if you're, I don't, you know, 40, she'd be like destroying the Excel center. Where's my boyfriend? Anyway, so she's pretty big. So how are we going on? So this is the biggest octopus ever. This is the GPO, or the Great Pacific Octopus. And these things are massive. They are the biggest octopuses. They're three meters across. And they hold another world record for being the best mothers on earth, the best invertebrate mothers. They lay a clutch of eggs, and they want to make sure nothing eats those eggs. They lay up to 120, and they guard them. And uh, during this time, they don't eat, and they just blow oxygenated water over the eggs to make sure that they survive. How long does she look after her eggs for? How long do we reckon? Shout out a number. A year. Good guess. It's actually um, four and a half years is the world record. That is the world record for an invertebrate looking after her eggs. And as soon as they hatch, she dies. She, her work there is done. The other cool thing about Great Pacific Octopus is, you've ever been in the pub and you wanted to know the answer to that eternal question, what would win in a fight, a shark or an octopus? Well, it turns out it would be an octopus. This is a, uh, the taken from um, the, ta the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is a clip from one of their tanks. And the octopus was lying at camouflage on the bottom of the tank. And every time sharks went past, they'd go, <coughs> get up and grab it, turn the shark upside down. It initiates a state called tonic immobility, where basically the shark's like, huh, what's going on? I've never been upside down before. This is really weird. And then it can just slowly eat the shark. So there we go. So they had to start, they had to put the sharks and the octopuses in different tanks. So why else are they cool? Well, they're covered with these all over their skin. These are called chromatophores. And these are cells, um, tiny little pack pockets of muscles with reflective layers and pigments inside. So they can change color and they can change texture. An octopus's skin is so amazing that even if you remove it from the octopus and shine lights on it, it still changes colour without needing to be attached to the octopus. And so this makes them masters of disguise. So this is an octopus camouflage and you can see it doesn't show itself until much, much later on. And you can see it can change its texture and its colour to perfectly blend in with the background. I think that's absolutely incredible. But also, you can take them and you can put them in unnatural places, like inside a boat. So this guy's like, oh, I don't mean in a boat, oh whoa, and it can instantly go white, just like that. And that is probably a colour that they're not that familiar with in the, in the ocean. So amazing. Not all octopuses have chromatophores. This is the Australian burrowing octopus. This doesn't have any chromatophores. So its defense mechanism is it can build burrows insanely quickly. So it has a really strong siphon at the bottom. It blasts the, the sand, turns it into quicksand, goes down through it, and so the sand doesn't collapse in on it. As it goes down through the sand, it secretes loads of mucus and makes basically a snot sand tunnel so it can still breathe. Now that is not the best place ever if you're bringing ladies back to your pad. Hey, come to my house. Yeah, I made it from my own mucus and sand. Yeah, let's get busy. So, uh, what else are they cool? Well, they're masters of escape because they're just giant bags of muscle. The only hard part in an octopus is its beak. And 
if it can get its beak through a hole, then the rest of the octopus can follow through. They're covered in suckers, they're insanely dexterous, and they're also really intelligent. This is its beak, this is how, this is the, uh, the hard part, so if we can get that beak through a gap, then the rest of it can follow. You can lock them inside jars, and they're so clever, they figured out how to escape from the jar by undoing the jar from the inside. This one seems to get a little bit scared and just goes straight back in again. Oh no, I'll just go back in. So they are pretty amazing in that respect. Now this is the thing, Brighton Sea Life Centre kept hab having fish go missing from its tropical display and they found out that the octopuses had figured out how to undo the filtration system, navigate through all the pipe work using the temperature gradients to navigate until they would find the tasty tropical fish, eat them and then work their way back to the tank and be like, no oh, mate, don't know what's going on there, honestly, I uh, wasn't there. So then, while they've sorted out the filtration system to make them octopus proof, they were like, you know what, let's just put the octopus in a tank in the middle of a room, standalone system, nothing could go wrong there. And then they caught it on CCTV, holding its breath as it went along the side of the tank, across the floor, into another tank, ate the fish, and then worked its way back again. So these things are insanely difficult to capture, look after, and keep. So why else are they amazing? Well, they can use tools. Using tools is one of the benchmarks in the animal kingdom for intelligence. We can see monkeys do it and certain species of crow do it as well. However, this is the only invertebrate that uses tools. This is the coconut octopus and it lives in a habitat where there's not lots of rocks and things to hide. So it finds two halves of a coconut and if threatened, it just goes Hoo-doosh! and covers itself in a coconut and be like, yeah, honestly, I'm a coconut. This guy's a little bit special and has found a Pringles lid instead of the other half of his coconut, but I like to think it would still offer him just as much protection. But it is not nothing compared to this guy. This is the most insanely intelligent octopus ever. When this, this is the mimic octopus, again, it lives in Indonesia, in places where there's not, ma not many rocks and things to hide. So when it's born, it takes a step back from the world and it does a little bit of people watching. It comes, it comes along and it sees what animals come by and what different animals are scared of what animals and what animals are not interested in other animals. And depending on what predator it's faced with, it will pretend to be an animal that that predator is not interested in or that that predator is scared of and being able to retain that information, being able to mimic another animal and then do puzzle solving to be like, well, that animal didn't like that one, so I want to pretend to be this. So what can they do? They can pretend to be balls of seaweed. They can pretend to be hermit crabs running along the seabed like this. They can put their arms into the sand and then they undulate themselves and look like a sea snake, one of the most venomous animals in the sea. They can bunch all their tentacles up and have one coming out the back, so they look like a stingray. They can bunch them all together like this, so they look like a flatfish moving across the surface of the sand. And if all that fails, and they're still like, well, seriously, mate, please go away. They'll just be like, big and black, don't mess with me. Like that, which is quite cool. So they are amazing, amazing animals. So they are so intelligent that they get bored really easily. And if you put them in a tank by themselves, they get depressed. Sometimes they start self-harming and biting their own tentacles off. So there is actually a job where you have to go and play with octopuses every day to keep them entertained. They have favorite toys, just like a child would. This one particularly likes Mr. Potato Head. And it really, it's really useful if you want them to put them in a different tank. You'd be like, come on, Mr. Potato Head's in this tank and it will have go much happily, more happily, and it will stay there much easier. I also like this one. It just makes them look really clever. Like, yes, I just did this Rubik's Cube. Give me another puzzle. I think it was just playing with the Rubik's Cube. It wasn't actually doing it. So, we've seen that octopuses are insanely intelligent. We've seen that they're invertebrates. But the problem is, is they've got a slight couple of flaws to them. They've also got some amazing anatomy. So if we look inside them. This is the crazy thing about an octopus, okay? So 90% of our nerves are in our brain and the remaining 10% are our nerves that go through our body. So our brain can send signals to the rest of us to say, to move or so we can feel things. In an octopus, only 30% of its brain is in its brain. 
the remaining 70% of the octopus's brain is distributed throughout its entire body, which means that its limbs can think independently of each other. If you cut an octopus's arm off, it will continue to try and feed a mouth that no longer exists. And some species of octopus actually use this as a defense mechanism and will deliberately remove an arm that will continue to writhe around in the water and, and give something for a predator to eat so then they can escape. And then they can grow their arm back. But now this is the problem. We've seen that these things learn insanely intelligently. Now, I have a, they unfortunately have been dealt an evolutionary backhand. They have got copper-based blood. They've got hemocyanin in their blood. So their blood is a bluey green colour. Our blood has got hemoglobin in it, which is an iron-based compound, which means that, uh, which is why our blood is red. So our blood is really efficient at working at the temperatures that we live at, but doesn't work very well when we get cold. Octopus's blood can work at a much wider range of temperatures, but it is much less efficient than our blood. It's not very good at carrying oxygen. So as a result, an octopus has got three hearts. It's got its main heart, its systemic heart, and it's got two branchial hearts, one um, above each of its gills. And so effectively, the octopus is running for its entire life. It's like, its heartbeat's just going ten to the dozen to keep the oxygen circulating around. And eventually, they basically burn themselves out. And not, octopuses don't tend to live longer than about six years. And this is the crazy thing, because we live on a blue planet. It is the largest habitat on Earth. And if aliens were to come to Earth with the mission, please take a life form from this planet that is representative back to our home planet, then they would take something from the ocean, because we are a blue planet, 70% covered in water. So what would happen if, for some weird evolutionary quirk, that octopuses ended up living as long as we did with their, with their ability to think, to problem solve. A two-year-old octopus is more intelligent than a two-year-old child. They would be the dominant life form on this planet. And then I don't think there's often an animal that comes along that makes us evaluate our place on this earth as the top species and how easily just a quirk, whether we had copper-based blood or iron-based blood, just that one difference in elements would mean that we were no longer the dominant species. So there we go. That is why I got a tattoo of an octopus and hopefully you will all run out and get a tattoo of an octopus like me and this lady over there. Yeah, octopus tattoo crew. Yeah. So I'd like you all guys to give yourselves a high five. Really quickly, give yourselves a high five and I'll tell you what for in a minute. Give yourselves a high five because you guys have now become slightly more ocean literate. What does that mean? I hear you ask. Well, let me tell you. Ocean literacy is knowing a little bit about how the ocean influences you and how you influence the ocean. Now, the problem is this isn't taught at school. What? All this stuff about the sea isn't taught at school. We keep growing up teaching generation after generation of children who don't know anything about the sea unless they happen to stumble across some documentary or have a parent that's really, really into it, which is a crazy idea. I used to be a secondary school science teacher and I visited, I taught in Brighton and places like that, but my friends taught in the school 10 minutes drive from the beach and has children in her class who are 16 who have grown up 10 minutes from the sea their entire life and have never ever seen the sea. I went and gave a talk at a school in Luton and a third of the kids in this school had never seen the sea, which is a crazy idea because we are an island nation. We're the ninth largest island on earth. You can never be more than 70 miles from the sea. This point here is the point in the United Kingdom furthest from the sea. Cotton in the Elms, the BBC went there and brought a little sandcastle to kind of celebrate that. But we're never more than an hour away from it. So how can we be bringing up people that don't know anything about the sea? So then I thought, I know, I'm going to have a fun day. I'm going to read the national curriculum. Let's see what's going on there. So I went through and I was looking for words like ocean, beach, sea, things like that. And I thought, well, maybe this is where the problem is. So I looked at the science curriculum. 
And the problem is, is that teachers can teach about it if they want to, but they don't have to teach about it. It's suggested as one of the things they could teach about, but they could also do it with woodlands or rainforests. And too often, because this is a more familiar habitat for the teacher, this is the one that they tend to teach the kids as well. And the same thing goes. Again, they can work scientifically, they can observe things, life cycles of plants, but again, they might want to use the woodland or rainforests, or they want to use the desert or prehistoric times. Which is all good, but there's not anything hard and fast about the oceans in there. So I was like, I know where it's going to come in. I'm going to go through the geography curriculum. This is going to be great. So and I thought, finally, this is where the ocean literacy is coming in. It says they've got to have a knowledge of the globally significant places, terrestrial and marine. I was like, yes, good work, geography. What this actually means is that children have to be able to point out where the world's five major oceans are on a map. I was like, whoa, that is some severe ocean literacy going on there. But it gets better because you also have to be able to use words like sea, ocean, river, beach, cliff, coast in the correct context. Yes, I'm going to the cliff. No, that's a beach. Oh, OK, thank you. There we go. So that is our ocean literacy currently in the national curriculum, which we need to do something about. So fortunately, we've invented and developed this um, education project called Incredible Oceans. And the idea is that we're going to support the existing national curriculum and accidentally teach people about the sea at the same time. Whoa, so check it out. There's our website there. And um, I'm just going to end with a cute picture of an octopus. It's an octopus baby. It's so cute. And there's some like hashtag e email -y web address things if you'd like to get in contact. Thank you ever so much for listening.